And we are live on this Friday afternoon. Today, it's just the beef show. No Barnsey. So uh, please be gentle with me while I'm trying to uh, navigate both sets of this, not just uh, not just my part in the show. Um, so without further ado, let me just get my stuff together and I'm going to introduce our first guest. He is the VP of Marketing at Storm. He is the uh, a 2016 USBC Hall of Famer. He's a two-time Eagle winner two world championship gold medals. And on top of that, he even made the TV show as an amateur at the 2018 USBC Masters. So I we will welcome to the Beef and Barnsley show, Steve Klumpkin. Hey, Stu, how you doing there? Beef Stu, uh, um, thanks for having me again. I'm, I'm doing pretty well, actually, yeah. Um, always nice to see you, Steve. We have a pretty civil relationship. I'm not sure about the next person who I've got lined up. Um, uh, Mark Anderson, um, better known as uh, 80 Grit to his friends. Um, always rough and ready. He uh, He's run the Storm booth at USBC Nationals for 20 years. And he's been in the pro shop industry for almost 40 years. So that shows you how old he is. Well, here we go. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Hey, Stewie, how are you? Hey, Kalamar. What's up, Mark? Hey, uh, 80 Grit was a, a nickname I received a long time ago. Stu, you know I'm a much softer, easier going guy now. Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see about that. <laughs> Your new nickname okay. probably would be more like, it's, it is like maybe a 320 or, I don't know, 600. Are you up to 600 yet? Like a, we're just sticking with sandpaper? Stevie, I think I'm a uh, diamond gloss polish or factory polish or something. Man. I've, I've gotten so old and soft. Uh, I'm not the same person anymore. Old and soft. I'm not yeah. sure. That's, I'm not sure that's quite how we, uh, quite how everybody sees it. Who comes and sees you in the booth when they uh, <laughs> start walking around and moving every single ball that's in the place. Um, Stewie, that's not everybody in the booth. That's only you and your child. He doesn't move bowling balls. He moves the pin. <laughs> and and admit it, last year when he picked that storm polish up and he decided to stroll straight into the middle of the Ebonite booth and put it right on top of that big sticker right in the front, you thought that was quite funny. <laughs> I, I, had a I had a photo of that that I just deleted. <laughs> <laughs> so um, your, your two, uh, you, you two, your relationship goes back quite a ways, doesn't it? Oh man, I've known Stevie. Uh, uh, actually, I started out with the, another ball company at the uh, at the tournament, and uh, Stevie was uh, down the hall from us, and we were a little slow. And uh, this that was in the early stages of the storm, just when they were starting to take off. And we used to have grip wars where we would throw uh, grips over the uh, the top at each other, and that became a little too tame for me in the eighty grit days. So I was throwing inch and three eight slugs at climber over the booth and <laughs> not not inch and eight slugs inch and three eighths um, now now that was that was back when we had the we had the dexter we shoe had, uh, uh business in the booth. after that the grip and wars we were canceled to, from the booth we we had i it did it, it instigated some new policies uh, at the tournament that's for sure but i think there hey, may Stewie, be even i'm bad. sorry i got cut off there for a sec yeah uh Steve's just going through the new policies that you got uh, yeah. you created by your, your games. Yeah. Yeah, that was. And, uh, and I do remember too, as well, like we had, it was, we were fortunate enough as far as the layout goes that we had a TV that had a loop. Uh, this is a long time ago. So we had a VHS tape that was in and looped and we would crank up the volume and turn that thing up real loud and it would just blare all the store music right in Mark's face. So I think that kind of got him a little bit agitated uh, too, but it was <laughs> there, were a lot, there were a lot of good times. We actually didn't first meet there though. We actually met uh, back at country club lanes when we were bowling world team challenge. I was fortunate enough to bowl with John Gaines and HR. Hey, yeah, it was the, Can you bring your phone here, please. Good time. 
I'll take Mark out for now. Um, he's having some uh, issues. Yeah. So, um, right. Okay. Let's uh, let let's uh, move on with what we were advertising, shall we say? Um, when Mark gets his situation um, sorted, we'll bring him back in. Um, but right now, um, we're looking to build a six-ball arsenal. Um, I've actually had a little bit of a step up, um, uh, a little leg ahead from you guys because I just changed my grip a little bit once we came back from the break. Um, uh, I put a little bit more forward pitch on, a little bit more away on the fingers. Uh, my hand was starting to get old and not bending so much. So, um, so I actually have a pretty good idea of what I would do. Um, but, uh, with you on the technical side of it, um, you've done many things yeah. working at Storm. Um, how would you go about, uh, starting an arsenal? What would you, uh, what would be your tips? What would you look for? Yeah, the, the number one thing, and, and you're right about as far as like breaking down the size of the arsenals is you really have to look at how many different bowling balls you're looking to construct around an arsenal. You know, there's some people go in, a lot of people do use, you know, the, the number of three now because you usually take either one triple roller, two, you know, two triples or three. So like three, six or nine, you know, if you're bowling a league in a familiar place that you have, you may just bring a couple of bowling balls that you know will work along with maybe your spare ball. So we always like to construct or start with a spare ball as your number one thing. I mean, there's a, a few players, and I got to say it was one of my uh, favorite moments ever on Flow Bowling when we were watching Norm Duke, <laughs> Stu, and you and Tommy, and we were talking about Norm Duke shooting the 10 pin. And oh, yeah. <laughs> that was a classic moment. But Norm Duke is one of the few that can get the ball to roll straight with his – you know, he, he, sometimes he goes to the most hooking, dullest ball in his bag to shoot his spares, even when their lanes are hooking, because he can throw it completely end over end and dead straight, right? So yeah. you have to be able to. He's just showing off when he does that, though. Yeah, <laughs> because he can. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, but, but he gets the ball to go straight. There's a few other players who use their reactive balls to go straight, but basically all the best spare shooters in the world throw the ball straight at their spares. So that's the number one thing is you got to have a good spare ball. Majority of people will use a, a, a three-piece ball, uh, whether it's a urethane, like a mix, or a polyester, like an ice storm, something like that. Uh, but they'll use that to go very straight at their spares because then if their hand gets, gets around the side of it, it's still going to go on a straight line. So the spare ball is number one. Um, there are a few people, though, that do use a urethane ball, you know, a pitch black, for example, uh, is a great ball that can be a dual-purpose ball. So sometimes on the shorter patterns, the pitch blacks are just absolutely phenomenal for your strike balls. But some people, if they throw it either hard enough or get their hand at the back of it, uh, can use their urethane ball like a pitch black or pitch purple, something like that. You do that, don't you, Steve? I do from time to time, especially if I'm traveling, that because then it saves me a spot, you know. So that does so that does help quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, so that's yeah. I mean, I I will always take a plastic ball unless I'm at like a three ball arsenal, um, but. At the same time, for this uh, for this type of thing, I was going to go with like just create a six ball arsenal and uh, yeah, and then go from there. Um, yep. So maybe we'll leave the plastic balls out and we'll just go with six yeah. and see what it's like. I'm yeah. I'm just frantically trying to sort this out with Mark, so sure. I'm not sure. ignoring you. I'm just trying to get this uh, back on track. Yeah, yeah, no problem. And we'll, uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit as you're trying to go through that there. We'll just talk a little bit about maybe what a few of the uh, different uh, types of strategies are when you're looking at what your performance balls are in, like, let's say a six ball arsenal. Because I think that is very common. A lot of people nowadays use, you know, two three ball totes, tournament totes. They'll use those and they'll have their backpack that has their shoes and their accessories and their thumbs and all that other stuff combined there. So if you're looking at a six ball arsenal, I think the number one thing you got to ask yourself is, how many asymmetrical balls are going to be in that six, in that six ball set? Or if you're using a spare ball, you're going to have to look at five uh, versus how many symmetrical. Yeah, makes sense. So, and depending on the type of player you are, you know, you may want to go two, two asymms and three symmetricals. You may go one asymm and four symmetricals or, you know, three and two the other way with three asymms if you need a lot more performance or help out of your ball. Um, that, that would be That would be the main thing to consider. Yes, definitely. Um, Mark, can you hear us? 
I can hear you fine. Thanks. Sorry okay. about that. Cool. So I'm gonna I'm gonna create my arsenal um, based on a um, tournament player's perspective, like more on a, like a maybe like when we're traveling all over the world, because generally we get to take six balls with us. Um, Steve, I think that if you look at it from um, your experience as a bowler, but also from a technical side of where, where you would think would make the most sense technically. And then Mark, I think from your experience in the pro shop industry and what you see with customers coming in and uh, players turn up at nationals, um, what your suggestions would be. Does that make sense? Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, I deal, I think my, the, uh, the person I deal with, is a little different than than both of yours, though, because I, I I get the the person that comes in that averages 175 on a soft league shot. So, uh, I, I mean, four balls can pretty much cover a, a, a big percentage of, of my customers. Okay, well, that's that's that. Like, like I say, I picked six because it was kind right. of uh, just a a number out of thin air. But if you feel like four is probably more appropriate, that's fine. Um, so what I've done is, let me, um, if I do it, let's see how this comes in. Um, so what I've done is I've done like a little spreadsheet so that we can kind of keep track of what we're looking at. And um, I, think, uh, I think everybody's going to pick one kind of super strong ball. Um, so how about I go first? So for me, the, the ball I'm going to put at the top of my arsenal is going to be uh, one of the balls that I think is the most early rolling ball that we've got at the minute in the high-end balls. And I'm going to go with the Rotor Group UFO. I think that I'm not going to be in a situation where I don't have a strong enough ball. And I think for me personally, that's um, – that's a that's a good starting point. Um, other options there um, would definitely include uh, Gravity Evolve um, or the uh, the new Omega Crooks. I think. Um, Steve, what do you like as like say the strongest ball in your bag? Yeah, you had just mentioned uh, Omega Crooks, and and that's the one that I would put down there. Um, okay. And I think a lot of that is you know is going to be that based off as far as the style. And looking for something that's going to make sure that it gives you enough kick down lane, knowing that you can always add a little bit more surface. You may not need to go all the way down to 80 grit, Mark, but, you know, you can add a little <laughs> bit more surface and get that Omega Crux to read on just about anything. Yeah, I, I enjoy the Omega Crux a lot. And I might actually, to a large extent, have more use for that ball. I just feel like if I'm traveling, unless I know the place in advance, I'd like to have the base covered because... If the ball doesn't pick up, it, it's really hard to find a way to trick it at that point. I have a lot more tricks with being able to like really get it through the front. So that's why I'm going to go that way. So Mark, um, I would say that um, a lot of the a lot of the customers that you see may well be speed dominant. Would that be fair? Uh, yeah, yeah, de definitely speed dominant would be most of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and like uh, Stevie said too, I, I mean, I, I sell a lot of those uh, a pearl or a shiny ball, and we'll scuff we'll scuff, scuff the heck out of them to start, you know, until we fine tune it. And, and that's for the, my guys that uh, Stu, they can't drill five or six or seven of the same ball until they find the right one. So we so we definitely we we push a lot of surface adjustment at the booth uh, during the tournament. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, um, what would be your number one recommendation then for sort of like the strongest ball in people's bags? You know, uh, I don't, uh, again, I have a different client base. Yeah. I don't have a, uh, we talked about this for the speed dominant guys. I would, that Omega Crux, I, I, I like quite a bit. And that, that UFO looks uh, very good. Unfortunately, th those are two newer balls that I didn't see go down the lane very often because of the, the COVID closed down. Right. Uh, so it, w w my customer base with the older guys, I try, 
I try to stay away from a lot of asymmetrical stuff in, in their arsenal. Okay. Cause they, okay. Just because the core gets it to stand up too quick and they never see any down lane motion. Mm -hmm. you, you know, Stewie, for a four ball arsenal, I, I have some customers that they have four uh, f phase twos in their bag, honestly. Right. No, no, that makes sense. So you, you really focus more on surface adjustment rather than necessarily like anything exotic with layouts or the balls or cores. Correct. I mean, we'll, we'll, uh, I keep the layouts pretty simple with, with most of the customers too, because, uh, when you spread it out too much, you have some stuff that starts overlapping. So I do try to keep the basic, the uh, layouts pretty simple or basic for most of the people at the booth, unless they're looking for a, a very, very specific reaction and, and then we'll change it or trick it up a little bit. Okay. So, uh, what are we going with here then, Mark? What would you like uh, is the strongest ball that you'd recommend to a guy? Uh, man, that, that UFO looks you, really you, strong. I, I would think that would be the – that's one of the strongest motions I've seen. So uh, I'm going to just put this in the number two hole for you because you're going to okay. do two, three, four, five because you were thinking more of a four-ball four, four, arsenal. Four-ball four, four arsenal. Okay. Um, right. Well, um, now that we've got that established, we can uh, we can go anywhere we want with this. So, I, as we travel around a lot, uh, I'm going to go with a pitch black. I'm going to suggest that there's almost no chance that Mark recommends a pitch black to anybody. Uh, uh, only to you and uh, Jesper when you come to Boulder Masters is the only time I ever <laughs> drill very many <laughs> drill very many pitch blacks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what what are you thinking, Steve? Uh, you can put it in no. any you want. I just I just no. put black in because it's more yeah. fun. To get That's absolutely the same one I'm putting in there too. Okay, so you're doing a pitch black too. Absolutely. It's amazing how over the time that that kind of ball is really um, it's become almost a go to for a bunch of guys. I think with the rev rates going up of just people in general, like. The average league ball, I think their rev rates higher as well now. Um, certainly of the younger, um, the, the younger generation. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. And, and pitch black is is just one that you can't, you know, it, it covers too many bases on too many variety of conditions. You know, and whether you are looking at a condition like even if you do look at the team event, for example, at the Open Championships, where where they can get, uh, you know, I talked to David Haynes, for example, and some of the amateurs that do have a higher rev rate. That comes in handy there as well when the back ends are real dry and it's kind of unpredictable a little bit with reactive. So, so I, I'm I'm sticking with pitch black and you know I can say it, it may be a different layout or surface depending on the style, but pitch black is there for me. Okay, Mark, what would you like to uh, add to this four ball arsenal of yours here? Uh, after my UFO, I'm gonna go back to the uh, storm side. And I'm gonna I'm gonna throw the phase two in there for uh, right after that. Okay, that's a that's always a solid choice. Um, for me, I've actually got my arsenal written down here, so I've got to. Uh, um, so I think that because the UFO is so strong, um, I like the phase two also. But I'm gonna put in. I'm not gonna go. I'm gonna go the one asymmetrical ball route. And then I below that I'm going to go with the latest strong symmetrical ball from Storm. I'm going to put the Axiom in underneath my UFO. Um, mm. I feel like that gives me a good gap from the really the top of the arsenal to the middle. Like it's very easy to get a big gap between kind of like if you use a UFO. I feel like if I had gone with the Omega Crux like you did, Steve, I mm -hmm. might not have needed a stronger ball as the Axiom for the next one, but. With going with the UFO, um, I feel like that could be a little slow on some of the patterns if I didn't have something, you know, really close to it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, for my my second ball or my next ball underneath that, I actually like astrophysics. Okay. So, oh, the astrophysics. Yeah, because it's just a cleaner uh, ASIM, um, and it's one that's still going to make that corner strong, but it's going to be a lot cleaner. And uh, it really was kind of when I was starting to think about this when you threw that out there is, 
you know, what would be a good option here for that two ball. And the other one I was kind of going back and forth with uh, was the nuclear cell, because I think that fits a similar purpose. And and I love, I mean, that's a proven core shape as well. So that's kind of a tough call for me. So it could have been either or, but, you know, astrophysics is, I think is a good choice there. But being as you're a storm guy in the office, not a rover guy in the office, you just yeah. dis yeah. dismiss that's, that rover grip ball. That's kind of where I'm at. I'll still, I'll still give a little shout out to Shlem though. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! I mean, Sh Sh Schlem would have me uh, would ha would have me hoisted up right now. I've got I've got two stone balls to one rotor grip ball. He'd be like, "Come on, bro, show us some love." That's right. So, um, I think me and Steve are going to go one more before we bring Mark back in. Um, so for me, off this, I am going to have my next ball down is going to be the idle. Um, for me, the phase two and the idle are very interchangeable over which one you can use or you, you know what I mean? Like I feel like they cover similar bases. I just think they do it in a different shape. But in a six ball arsenal, I've done it before, but it, you have to really mess around with surfaces to really be able to have a phase two and an idle in a six ball arsenal. Um, I feel like the idle. I don't know in your in your experience, Steve, but I feel like the idle takes surface changes a little bit better. Um, like I think it's it it it's more versatile. One like the difference between a shiny idle and a dull idle is bigger than the yeah. difference between a shiny phase two and a dull phase two. I just might yeah. might just be the way because it's the one color ball or whatever. But it just seems in my experience when you shine the idle up, it becomes like pretty long and really quick off the spot. Whereas I don't mm. see that so much in the phase two. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, so what, what, what have you got next for your arsenal? You can go in any of the spots just, uh, well, it, you know. admittedly, we're going to have some, we're going to have some gaps around there, but what I'd like you to do, if we can jump down to the four for me, yeah, is I think, I think we got to put in that, that good benchmark, uh, that benchmark ball in, uh, for me, that's going to be a IQ tour. Hey, there we go. The, R, the RG, the diff, the unique shape and the surface. Uh, that's a ball that, you know, we, we do a lot of work with the uh, collegiate uh, teams. And that's one of the ones that back and forth you'll hear where they have the limited balls. That, you know, they can check in only five balls for a tournament, for example. <laughs> and just across the board, you'll you'll hear all of them say, you absolutely have to have an IQ tour in your bag. And, and I'm throwing that one in there. <laughs> Mark. Okay, Mark, what, what, what are you fancying to... Uh fill out your arsenal a little bit more here oh man i like the iq tour in, in in my three spot two with a little bit of polish but okay. uh you, you know for my more recreational type of guy too and stevie's talking about the iq tour as a benchmark i don't think any arsenal uh for a uh a guy that doesn't carry a, a ton of balls you can't have a big arsenal without a high road in there too so um yeah. Kind of torn, True. kind of torn in there too. I, I'm gonna go since Steve stole the IQ tour, and this is like the uh, PBA draft. I'm gonna throw the, <laughs> I'm gonna throw the, I'm gonna throw the high road in there, and uh, maybe uh, uh, tweak the surface uh, back up and down a little bit on that. Okay, um, I like where you're going now. Um, these, my last two balls could be very interchangeable in the fourth or the fifth spot. So I'll put this in the fifth spot just because um, for the techie people out there, I throw 16 pound balls. So uh, no, I'll put it in this one in the four. I'm going to go with the high road also in that spot, but in 16 pounds, the high road is a lot stronger than it is in 15 pounds, just because of the way the numbers are. So it flares a lot more. So it's quite, it's, it's, it's a smoother ball in 16 than it is in 15. Um, so that's where I'm going with that one. So this, cause it's my personal arsenal. I'm going with the high road as the four spot just underneath my idol. What are you liking Steve? Uh, for my five spot, I'm going to go off, uh, just a little bit kind of building on that high road mention. Um, but you know, there were some huge wins last year on the, uh, in the women's U S open and in Detroit for Jason Belmonte, uh, and Danielle McEwen there. And that was with the ball that was clean on those high friction surfaces. That's the high road pearl. 
Yes, that was, that was definitely one that I uh, considered adding to the Arsenal for sure. So, Mark, um, fourth ball, what, 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 what are you suggesting? And Stu, this is a, uh, a tougher part for me too because I get a, I get, I get a lot of customers that come in that are thinking that they want to add a, a, a surge or something like that. But Stu, if you're traveling and, and, and you want to have something that you can still shoot spares with or something like that, mm -hmm. most of the guys don't have enough hand or wrist to get that, that ball to ever really come in play, uh, come in, come in play at the thing, you know, uh, the high road Pearl that Stevie talked about would be underneath that for a lot of the guys, but I'm going to kind of go off the board to a ball that I think is a little bit stronger. And I hope this doesn't uh, tick anybody off because uh, Barnes paid me to say this. I would <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to throw a boost at, at, as my uh, weak Ooh. ball down there. That's for my brother Barnes who, uh, wasn't on the show today, but I have him represented with my jersey in the background. Well, that's a uh, yeah, that's a a reasonable suggestion for sure. We're not we're, we're not going to throw you off with Joe. Although, um, you know, how 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 do you say it as a parent? I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, um, and uh, for my last ball. In this six ball section, I'm going to go with an IQ Emerald. And that's what I was talking about. I feel like the High Road and the Emerald are quite mm. interchangeable uh, with which spot they could be in. Because, like, it feels like the, the, the High Road is going to be, it's more hook overall, but it's cleaner. Whereas the Emerald is, it doesn't hook as much in terms of covered boards, but with it being low RG seems to be a little bit uh, earlier and a little smoother. So that would be my six ball arsenal. Um, and then yes. depending on where we were going, I would fit my plastic ball in, in, in place of one of the balls, I think. Mm. Um, what about you, Steve? Uh, I would, I, and I like that, that Emerald there. That one that had a great presence there in Vegas too, you know, with, uh, you had Frankie uh, made the show there and they were using axioms and emeralds and, uh, Simo was as well, but uh, for me, Stu, you know that if I'm bringing if I'm bringing some balls, um, I I just can't go anywhere without a phase two. So uh, I'm gonna have to uh, buddy that one up right next to Mark's option there, phase two for sure. So uh, so Steve had a complete shutout of Roto Grip. That was nice. Yeah, appreciate it. But the nuclear cell was absolutely right there in my number oh. two. Uh, with the astrophysics. <laughs> <laughs> First one out. I'm sure Schlem loves that. First one this out. Is right. this, is just, this is just round one, though, right? Yeah. 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 Um, oh, man. So, uh, guys, and I don't know if you know, if, if you noticed there, I, I covered all the brands. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, See, this is what happens when Chris isn't here to help me out. I completely forgot about the comments section. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, let's let's have a quick flick through. Um, uh, let's see. Well, Jordan Nasberg says Mark Anderson tells some great stories. <laughs> He's got a few. Chris from the road says, uh, nice shirt, 80 grit. I assume he's talking about the one <laughs> hanging, not the one you're wearing. <laughs> um, this is this is the Steve Klompkin design. That's right. Uh, In collaboration cool. with Mark Anderson. Somebody who noticed my board behind. Um, uh, Chad Chad McLean giving us a shout out. Uh, Mr. Technical himself. Uh, he he likes uh, he likes Tina's board. Um, uh, uh, quickly, quickly, quickly. Let's see if we've got any questions. Uh, let's see what this question says. Does the RG before drilling the bowling ball affect the motion on the lanes or does the cover soccer mention more? I'll throw that one over to you, Steve. Um, yeah. People hear me talk about things like that all the time. So what's your thoughts on that? 
Well, if you're looking at what affects it more between the RG or the cover stock, I'm going to say cover stock because it's the actual part that does touch the lane. And we actually just posted a recent video with uh, differences in the exact same ball. Uh, we did it with an Axiom and went through a wide gamut from the surfaces uh, just by adjusting the surface prep. And you can see uh, it's a huge, huge effect uh, that the surface has on the ball. Again, just because it's touching the lane. Can you ignore the RG? Absolutely not. It's just if you're factoring everything together. Um, and there was a study by this uh, quite some time ago as well at USBC that had basically verified that, which I would say that we we pretty much had had felt all along that absolutely the surface uh, is number one and cover stock is is going to be the king. Yeah, that would be. I'm definitely on that train. Um, but you know, ev everything has extremes. Like if you have a reactive ball with no core, then you know. Yeah. It's <laughs> it, it, it yeah. really has to go to one extreme or another. It's just if all things are like normal, then that's the case for sure. Yeah. Do you have something to add there, Mark? It looked like you were. I, I, I did. But I didn't want to add something. I actually wanted to ask Stevie a question too about uh, Stevie. How would you explain that to uh, you? Explain that well, and I would believe a higher average guy. But I get a lot of questions from the people that, that come in that have been re, uh, reading magazines and uh, they mm. average 175. And I, I, I don't want to discount that because that's pretty much where I've made my living my entire life. But uh, explain it to that guy that, you, you know, you, I think you're putting the uh, cart before the horse there. You, you want to try to improve a little bit and match up some stuff and not not get too far ahead of the game. there. thinking about RGs and and diffs and that kind of stuff. So Stevie, maybe you could educate me on this a little bit on how I would con, uh, convey that to a customer coming in and not, I don't want to discount and say, Hey, it doesn't matter, but maybe, maybe you yeah. can help me explain, explain it to them in, in percentage of what effect it's going to have on their ball. Their yeah. Ball one. And it is hard. It is hard to say and, and, and put down. And, and we used to do that years ago. We used to say that X number percent was, you know, we'd say 45% of ball reaction is this or 25% is that. And we really had sort of determined over time that it's really not a good idea to say that it's a specific number that you can attribute to at all times because there are enough variables with different oil patterns, uh, with the different surfaces and the different styles and that. Um, but, you know, the number one thing, you know, when you're looking at that, that, that makes sense to me when I'm looking at what matters in ball motion is going to be the part that actually does touch the lane. The, the core does matter as far as when you get to the highest level, but when you're looking at um, the different performances inside the, the, it's kind of like in golf. It's, it's kind of like inside, you will see the, the professional golfers at the highest level will be able to tell the most minute differences between golf ball, A, B, C, D, and E and how they perform in the air and how they, you know, different types of performance when it hits the green or hits the rough and all these little nuances. And then you and I go out there, we swing our club and we skull it into the grass. Right. And then we're concerned like, well, maybe I needed a, a four piece urethane with a softer mantle on this something or another. And, you know, there's a, there's, there's just that thing where it's uh, you know, it, it is, it is unseen inside the bowling ball. It does matter as far as performance goes, but what's more important right now is really what Stu's doing, which is, how do you build an arsenal that has a variety of, of performance characteristics? And whether this ball performs different because it has a mass bias, uh, you know, intermediate differential of 0 0.018, and this one has a 0 0.014, and this one, you know, these other things are, are just all part of putting together a variety, like a set of golf clubs, really, you know, putting making sure that when you show up at the golf course, you know, you have a, a five, six, seven, eight, nine iron and not, you know, five, seven irons, basically. Stevie, I, I use that I use that analogy at the booth uh, a ton of times, where the guy uh, a guy will come in, and without changing the surface, he'll come in and he goes, "Man, I have a, a phase two, and then I got phase two is probably not a great example. I have a, a UFO, and uh, I love that UFO. Uh, I'd like to get another UFO, and they go, "What do you think of that?" And I go, "Sir." I have a driver in my bag and I love my driver, but I don't carry three drivers in my bag. Uh, unless you're going to hit the long ball, though, Mark. Come on. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, we uh, one uh, th this is another good question from Charles. He says, if you don't have quite the rev rate, would you replace the pitch black with the pitch purple? Oh, that's a good question. And as far as that goes, if you're looking at what's the difference between, you know, I say a pitch black and a pitch purple, pitch purple is definitely a little bit stronger and more aggressive than the pitch black. And uh, if you were to, you know, wanted to replace it and either adjust the surface or adjust the layout, then you could possibly do that. Um, it would, would be a step up though, and it would definitely be more performance. We uh, have a great amount of success throwing the pitch purple when we were in Korea. And there were a lot of people there at the Domino's uh, Cup in Korea this past winter that were using the pitch purple with a lot of success. Uh, but it is definitely stronger, more aggressive down lane and gives you more overall hook, that's for sure. Um, a guy from England, Danny says, um, what's more important, RGs or diffs? Um, I'll give my answer to this, Steve, and then you can see whether uh, the layman's description of it makes more sense. I consider the RG to be more about how quickly the ball makes its move, like how violently, whether it's a smoother one or a, like more of a skid snap. And I look at the diff as just basically the overall hook and like how soon it is on the lane, whereas – the RG is more about the shape. Would that be a simple way of looking at it? Or am I completely miles away and that's just confusing people more? No, I, I, th I think that's pretty close. There are different examples. You know, back in the early days, we used to simplify it a little bit and say RG was the length. And this goes back when Mark and I were talking frequently regarding the booth and the new balls that were coming out and stuff. And, and we would look at the RG as the length potential and look at the potential is the hook potential. Now, in some further discussions and, and further, you know, just kind of examination over time and talking a little bit more and looking more at the science behind it, if you were to ask me that same question right now, which you are, I would say that the RG matters more. And the reason for that is that the differential, for the most part, except for the, the, the extreme ends of the scale, for the most part, you can adjust for the amount of flare potential you're getting, which is a result of the differential with the layout. So let's say, for example, I've got three different balls. I have one ball that has 25 diff, one that has 35 diff, and one ball that has 50 diff. If I want to get the same amount of flare potential out of all three of those balls, I can by adjusting the layout, but I can't change what that RG is going to be. Right. There you go, then. So um, Patrick asks, now, not, now we're going down a rabbit hole here, Mark. You're going to love this question. <laughs> Would it be possible to show the RD and uh, RG and diff of the balls after they've been drilled for customers? Because undrilled balls, those numbers mean a little bit less. I feel like. <laughs> Stevie, I'll let you uh, answer that question. Uh, but I will I just give you I, one, Patrick, I, one way of looking at this. If you can, if you get enough understanding of which layouts increase diff or decrease diff, then relative to the balls in layman's terms, it's going to be kind of similar. Like it's just a percentage change. Now, Alex and Chad could come on here and they could really break down what would mean that like which balls would be able to change more or less or whatever. Let's leave that one for another day. <laughs> um. Uh, Andy wants to know, uh, th this is quite fun because we can do this from different perspectives. Uh, me and Steve can do this as bowlers. Mark can do this as a pro shop guy. Uh, well, well, hey, Stewie. Uh, yeah. There were a couple balls that I really loved when I did use to bowl, but uh, I, I like the way you dismissed me right there. Go ahead. No, but what I'm saying <laughs> is, is, do you guys have a favorite ball of all time? And I feel like Mark's favorite ball of all time will be which one he made the most money out of. For me and Steve, that's which one we were most successful on the lanes with. With you, it was which one you managed to sell. So um, what's been your highest selling ball of all time, Mark? Oh, uh, virtual gravity, I would guess, Stevie. That one Stevie. was pretty yeah. Uh, that was, I wish we could have had 50 of them. Hey, uh, do we, <laughs> Bill I, 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 I want to tell you that, uh, the 
early days in the booth were uh, a touch of a struggle. And, and as things started to, uh, to be on the rise, uh, I remember having a phone call from Sims and he goes, things are, are going very well. Seems to be, uh, things look good at the booth. He goes, what have you been doing differently? And I go, Dave, if you keep uh, giving me virtuals to sell instead of uh, some of the other stuff that we struggled with a little bit, I'm going to be a better salesman every day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> there was something hypnotizing in that orange color in that cover, wasn't it? And it oh. hooked extra two arrows. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that ball was incredible. I remember when it first the the the, uh, the virtual gravity nano first came out um, was the year that Tom Hess won the Masters, and That's it was right. incredible. Like you could watch the sixty four man bracket, and there was like forty eight of them going down the lane. It was crazy. Like yeah. um, for me, my favorite ball of all time, man. I've got some balls that people don't like in my in uh, in my group of favorite balls of all time. Um, Victory Road Solid is always going to have a favorite, a nice place in my heart because I won my first title with that. Um, the Hypercell is probably my all-time favorite at the minute. Um, I say at the minute because if you win a tournament, like then it starts to elevate the other guys. Um, phase two is probably right now, though. But uh, yeah, that they're, they're my three anyway. What about you, Steve? I have a, uh, actually, I'm going to go out of screen here one second. I've got it right here next to me. <laughs> and this one happens to be an undrilled Woo. one. If you can see that bad boy. I can almost so, smell the chocolate from here, Steve. Yeah, look at that thing, that X Factor. And that helped me win my second eagle. Actually, was a layout recommendation from Mr. Mark Anderson. In the X Factor that helped me do that when it came out, and uh, so actually I do have a like I said an undrilled one here that is not for sale and not for any bartering or anything. So I don't care what you got. <laughs> yeah, this has been this is awesome. I would say X Factor, but in the modern day, I mean there is nothing for me that can replace a Phase Two. So the Phase Two rolls too too good on too many different conditions with different layouts, and I actively have you know four with me that I. I still bring and have for the last three years now. Here's a here's an interesting question. Uh, we'll do a couple more questions, and then I think me and Steve will uh, get Mark's help, and we'll expand our arsenals to ten to cover like <laughs> all ex all all, uh, all options. But here's a question: He says two inch pins, and this is good for Steve because Steve, as a bowler, uses two inch pins quite often. Versus yeah. urethane, which would you use, and when? like over one or the other. Yeah, yeah, and, and they they do serve similar purposes, just being that a two inch pin to pap on a reactive is gonna make the, make the reaction be more controllable and smoother, similar to what a urethane is. Uh, but even still, you know, all things considered, it's still cover stock that matters. So as far as reactives go, I still get a lot earlier break point with a urethane ball as compared to when I use a two inch pin reactive. So the two inch pin reactive works good for me when they are a little bit either fresher or shorter but it still goes through the fronts pretty quickly and it doesn't, it doesn't slow down at all like a urethane does. So they're, they're still fairly different types of motion for me, from my perspective. Yeah. I, I feel like the two inch pin ball is better when there isn't as much oil in the front part of the lane. Yeah. I feel like the urethane, if you imagine the front to back, this is the front of the lane. The more oil there is in the front, the urethane looks better because it goes through that front part and then it doesn't lose as much energy and it can continue better. Whereas if you find it where it almost feels like because of the lane surface that it actually hooks a little bit and then it skids, that's when I don't, that's when I struggle to use your thing because my rev rate isn't high enough. Um, mm -hmm. But okay. So uh, Steve, if you were to expand this, where do you think your biggest gaps are in this arsenal? Uh, that's a good question. I would I would like to say um, if we go in between the astro physics and the phase two, that we have a definite gap there for that high end, um, you know, higher performance uh, symmetrical. So I'm going to put axiom in there. So you're going to do an axiom now. Mm -hmm. 
I'm at, I'm going to put it on the same row, but it's going to be uh, just above the. I'm going to make space for the Omega. Um, and I would actually use the Omega Crook Shiny. Um, I think that I really like that ball, the the the, uh, the pearl cover. Um, I like how flexible it is and getting it shiny. I, I like that option um, for something that's quicker off the spot and it's really strong, strong ball overall. Um, mm -hmm. Look at those, Mark. Are there any obvious gaps that you see where we should be thinking about, um, you know, adding something in? For, for for your for your arsenals or mine? Uh no, for, for our arsenals. No, no, oh. we'll leave yours at four because that's like we're just talking about um building out these arsenals a little bit. Um, you know, for traveling around or just you know, bowling tournaments. Stewie, I, I have this question for you that I, I I mean we talk not all the time, but when bowling's going on, we do talk quite a bit. How often or how dry do they have to be for a tour player to throw a, a, a lower end ball like a, a hustle or a, an MVP? Is that something that, that, that you guys out on tour ever really squeeze into your arsenal out there? I'm sorry, I, I, didn't, give, I didn't give you a ball. I was just trying to. No, 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 100%. Um, I was actually thinking about that right now. Um, we, we tend to. Um, we tend to use those lower end balls more because of the lane surface than because there isn't much oil. Right. Because we have so much oil on the lane to start with that once it dries up, the, the weaker balls exasperate the issues and make it more over under because there's still a lot of oil there. So what a lot of the guys do is the guys almost towards the end of the blocks ball up and use stuff that, like, once they get to the point where you'd think, oh, man, they might need to use a really weak ball, they almost go the opposite way and use a stronger ball and roll it more and almost get it to bleed to stay on line. So um, there have been a few centers, like, off the top of my head, when we bowled in Akron a few years ago, Matt O'Grady used the hustles, and so did BJ Moore to make the show, and O'Grady won um, with a hustle ink. So, yes, I agree with you that I think that if you were building this arsenal for never changing anything out and only having these 10 balls, that something like a hustle would be quite useful. Um, yeah, that, 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 that hustle link was a, a, a road grip version of a, of a, a high road or a, I mean, that ball was around for, it's been around for a while. Yeah. The hustle link is very, very popular. I, I personally find that in those lower end balls, I've had more success and I've seen people with more success with the solid versions and like altering the surface than with the pearl versions. Um, I, I don't know why it's just the way, the way it seems that's all. So I, I would probably think about adding a hustle in. Um, I think that um, in the middle of the arsenal for me, um, if, if this was to travel around with all the time, I would probably include a phase two. And then the one last ball that I'd have, it, it'd be something like a high road pull, I think. Either a high road pull or um, or an idle pull. Stewie, uh, a, a ball that you didn't mention, and and uh, man, I've it rolls fantastic here, but I'm I'm not on. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm on one surface, so I don't get to see it on a lot of stuff like you do. But that wild streak has looked fantastic here here in roseburg 100 percent. yeah doing this right now has made me forget about the wild streak i just i appreciate the heads up because that was actually one of the points that i wanted to make how the wild streak is a ball that i think is fantastic for roto grip in general because it's so much different shape-wise to the other balls. So having something that is different is fantastic when you've got a bunch of different balls. Um, that was a very good call by you, Mark. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and Stevie, one more too, so I'm not uh, disregarding the Storm side of the family. 
man, that that phase three, I don't think you could make them fast enough before the COVID hit. That ball was that, that ball was on fire. And, and that's yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it was it was the hottest hottest selling ball we had for for quite some time. There, as soon as it was introduced, it was yeah, it took off like nothing else. And, and that that was one of those like we talked about the virtual there for a second. That phase three was a ball that uh, rolled great. And it never hurts that uh, we make the most beautiful balls in the business too. That right. ball was gorgeous. That so I have I have one here, one question here that's great. And being as it's so long ago, I don't think anybody can get upset with me. Uh, Raina says, how do you feel about the old Helix concept? And is the Benny Benny <laughs> today, right? Okay, yeah. I'm going to break this down for you. I'm going to leave Steve alone with this because it's another company. But at the same time, the Helix, in theory, was such a fantastic idea. In theory. In practice, it was one of the worst ideas in the history of bowling. Because you couldn't determine whether you were going to be on the urethane bit or the reactive bit. Even Walter Ray couldn't win with that ball. And he won with some of the worst balls ever made. <laughs> like, that ball was, theoretically, it was great. And it looked beautiful. Practice, eh, not so much. Hey, I, I know you said leave me out of it, but just real quick, I just want to say Mark and I, when that ball was introduced, Mark and I were working the same tournament yeah. uh, down in Huntsville, Alabama. And I do remember seeing that go down the lane for the first time. And uh, like you had mentioned, from a con conceptual thing, you're right. You, it, it makes uh, total sense. Uh, Stewie, I don't know if Steve remembers it. We were at Huntsville. I was uh, I left the uh, the one company I was working for, and I went to work the ladies tournament in Reno for Brunswick. So I actually sold the the helixes uh, at, at the uh, the uh, ninety eight tournament in uh, uh, Reno, Nevada, at the ladies tournament. So I drilled quite a few of the uh, of them to begin with. And when it came out, if, if you, I was a bowling junkie back then, I would think, man, this ball is going to be great. Except like you said, Stu, when it, it's a lot of times when it flared up, it was, it flared up on the urethane and not the, the reactive on the back end. And it, and it hit like a spud. <laughs> so there we go. We made it into a 10 there for me from, um from what i saw um yes it was very fun and i've even asked walter ray about using that ball and uh yeah he uh he didn't he didn't like the fact that his bow tie was so much in the urethane that every time like it it could do this or it could duck hook or i felt like the second one was a little better because there wasn't quite as much difference between the two materials so it wasn't quite as drastic, but I imagine that ball cost an absolute fortune to produce as well, um, doing two materials in that stripe and everything else. So, yeah, maybe that's a, a museum piece these days. Yeah. Um, Stevie still has a few holes in his arsenal. I do. I do. And I was going to tell you, and I don't want to shock you. I know this will shock Stu and this will shock Mark as well. But I would actually fill three of those slots there with three rotor grip balls. All right. But let me tell you this. Yeah, and I will start with the bottom there in between the high road pearl and the pitch black, which is the hustle ink. You're going with hustle ink. I go with the hustle ink. I did hustle question mark because there are two new ones that just came out. Mm -hmm. And Schlemmer has done the um, the name based on the colors, I believe, again. And I can never remember those latter combination <laughs> like one PDC or something well, it's, yeah you've got the you've got the hustle rap so for all the rap music fans out there that definitely makes sense that's a good one uh so hustle rap and then the pbr so PBR. here that's right we'll have some right. Uh, yeah so you've got the bull riding and the rap music okay that's right <laughs> and they go hand in hand yeah all right so so those are the those are the two new ones on that side. Uh, but as far as in between the phase two and the IQ tour, I think the Idle Pearl is a great choice. I would also on this, you know, kind of do the 
like I did before with the astrophysics. If, if I was choosing a storm option, if that one wasn't available, I'd go with the phase three, like what Mark had just mentioned. Okay. Um, yeah, which is uh, a little, just a little bit cleaner uh, uh, version of that with that same core from the phase two. Uh, but then uh, for that last spot right in there, uh, as I, I know I had mentioned Rotogrip before, um, and it is one that is not announced yet. And okay. we're not free, free to announce yet, but I'm telling you, it is phenomenal. Um, and depending on how you lay it out, because it, it has some different characteristics, it could go above or below the axiom. Um, but it is, yeah, it is really, really good. And you know, I'm a small guy, but I'm exactly. telling you, the, yeah, the, you're going to, you're going to be drilling, uh, you're going to see these going down the lane on the tour and, and at nationals at the open championships and everywhere else. Okay. So there we go. Steve doing the, uh, taking up the Chad McLean role of teasing everybody. Oh. I know you don't know. Do da, do da. Um, <laughs> Not the Balmo fan here. No promotion. I like the promotion. Yeah, me too. I do. Uh, you, you and I talked about that quite a bit. You struck how many times in Maine with it? I I struck eight in a row with with it. Eight in a row. We went down and did a promo the week after, and I went. I threw five shots and had five of them that split the eight and nine. Absolutely love it, and it had, but it is definitely a specialty ball that it has to have its right time and place on the right surface and, and oil pattern. For me, it rolls great. So, just a quick tease because of that promotion, um, I'm actually going to be on the Belmo show on Sunday night. Um, so, if you want to come and check that out, check out Belmo's YouTube page. It's going to be 8 p.m. Eastern um, on Sunday night. So, uh, yeah, well. I think that we can probably wrap this up. I don't know that anybody's got any questions. People are now trying to guess what it could be, the new Rotogrip tees. We've got a UFO pull. <laughs> uh, yeah, my mom. Oh, St hey, Stewie, hold on. Who, who, was that from, who was that from Leicester that uh, just posted That's, the question? That wasn't the question. That was my mom saying it's very low oh. here in Leicester. Hey, hey mom. Yeah. Uh, I, I watch, I watch your son's, uh, podcasts or streams, uh, fairly often. And I remember him asking, uh, one of the Tang brothers, if they won 5,000 or 10,000, what would they do with it? It was a million dollars, a million dollars. The first money out of my account would be to uh, fly Char and I over to Leicester for the Weber cup and watch team USA curb stomp, uh, the Europeans again. <laughs> <laughs> well you might get your wish um we'll see we'll, we'll see the teams, the teams the teams have been picked and they're going to be announced soon so we'll uh we'll, we'll we'll see what captain barnes has got this time um i think the smoke and mirrors might not they only exist in america they don't exist in england so we'll see we'll see how that goes but uh but anyway, guys, I really appreciate the time. Um, I think we had a bit of fun with it. We got a little techy. We got away from it. We we gave some guys some answers. And, uh, yeah, I think it was good. Although Cal is saying, ask Mark for a Baltimore story, at least uh, ones he can tell. Man, I had the uh, uh, Jordan there in – Baltimore story. All right. Uh, quick story where the 80 grit uh, kind of started. I used to have a small pro shop uh, right behind the back of a Bowl America Bowling Center. And uh, the mechanics would leave the doors open during the summer because it was so hot. So uh, me and the, the guy I worked for, Wayne Stepp, one of the great ball drillers from Baltimore, we would run in the back of the pits and we would take balls off one of the lanes and put them in the ball return four or five lanes down. And they spent the whole, uh, uh, the whole league sometimes looking for their balls down on different lanes uh, throughout the bowling center. Well, I'm just finishing out Jesper's arsenal. Um, there you go. <laughs> Somebody asked me for, uh, for uh, let me see if, uh, I don't think these arsenals will do for Jesper. So I created an arsenal just for Jesper. Crooks prime, pitch purple, pitch black, pitch black, pitch black. There you go. So, uh, yeah, I filled it out nicely for him. He uh, said. Yeah. So, all right, fellas. Well, thank
thanks again. Um, thank you, thank, Stu. Thanks for everybody for showing up and uh, their questions. And uh, we'll be back on Monday, and it will be the Beef and Barnsley show, not just the Beef show. So uh, see you soon. Take care. Thanks again. See you, Clark. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. See you.